This video is brought to you by one of the sexiest wallets I've ever owned, Extra Wallets. More information coming on later in the video. The ticking bomb. The staccato rhythm mirroring our heartbeat's unstoppable journey to its final destination. Each beat, a reminder, a regret, an opportunity, a moment built on another moment, increasing in tension as the timer gets louder and louder and smaller and smaller with us having no way to stop it. Originally a favorite way for film director Alfred Hitchcock to describe suspense in a scene, the ticking bomb model is made even more terrifying in the new film Tick Tick Boom, because it's used as a way to describe the tension of life itself. The constant ticking, counting down to turning 30 years old, and being faced with the dreadful thought of having accomplished nothing. The relationship between art and artist is complicated, with the love for the craft seeming to make up for the relentless beatings the artist makes in trying to make it. This typically goes unnoticed, with the final product, more often than not, masking the self-doubt, aggravation, and sleepless nights that went into creating it. So how does the history and presentation of Tick Tick Boom speak to the complex relationship between this magical presence of musical theater and the countless artists struggling to create it? Well, curtains up, Run Crew, because it's time to dive into a film that dares to ask, what if we took the greatest showman but didn't lie? It's time to learn and talk about Tick, Tick, Boom. To better understand this film and its significance, we first need to journey back to 1990 and meet a promising young composer named Jonathan Larson. After six years of working on a futuristic sci-fi musical named Superbia, he was realizing with each rejection notice and unanswered phone call that his dream of writing the next great American musical before the age of 30 was looking less and less likely. People just didn't get it. It featured a techno-pop score, people walking around with television sets on their heads, and it was unlike anything else that was considered commercially bankable on Broadway. But to Larson, that was kind of the point. By the 90s, the once grimy and rough theater district was becoming Disneyfied, with the shows reflecting that embrace of good ol' American commercialism. Sensing this shift, Larson wanted to do something different, reaching out to the estate of author George Orwell to get the rights to stage a 1984 musical. Shockingly, the young waiter at the Moondance Diner was rejected, but the theme still stayed consistent with Orwell's book. The story of Larson's production depicted a dystopian future where people would be consumed by screens and become tools of media corporations. The show went nowhere. And feeling dejected at Superbia's failure to launch, Larson decided to funnel that artistic frustration into a new piece. One that would come down from the cosmos to be an incredibly down-to-earth rock monologue of a fictional artist named Johnny staring down 30 and fearing he's wasted the time he's been given. The piece would first be called 3090, and then Boho Days. Boho was an informal way of saying bohemian. As Webster Dictionary describes it, a bohemian is a person usually a writer or an artist, that lives an unconventional life. No better words described Jonathan Larson. He was a man who truly embraced la vie bohème, living in a rundown fifth floor apartment in the West Village of New York with no heater, a bathtub in the kitchen, and a broken door buzzer, meaning that anyone who wanted to come up would have to use the payphone across the street to get Jonathan Larson to drop the keys down to him. His room was an eclectic whirlwind of books, sheet music, a keyboard, and a blinking Macintosh desktop that he used to write. While Boho was a great way to describe Larson, 
Nobody else knew what it meant. So he later changed the name to better reflect the descending bomb of time. Tick, tick, boom. The piece was stunning in its stinging relatability. So much so that a young producer named Jeffrey Seller saw Larson's 1990 production of the show and connected with the piece's underlying question. Is art a viable way to make a living? The next day, Seller wrote to Larson, telling him, I want to produce your musicals. Six years later, the two were on the cusp of starting public previews for a show that the New York Times had called Larson's first major New York event. It was a piece that he had been working on alongside Tick Tick Boom, and was a modernization of the opera La Boheme, set in contemporary New York. The show was called Rent. At midnight, following the final off-Broadway dress rehearsal at the New York Theater Workshop, Larson was told by a New York Times reporter that he had made a show which would change musical theater forever. To which Larson responded, It's not how many years you live, but how you fulfill the time you spend. Larson would pass away three hours later. A few years into Rent's triumphant Broadway run, David Auburn, who was Proof's Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, was presented with a collection of drafts, notes, cassette tapes, and video recordings of Larson's original Tick Tick Boom, and given a single mission. Turn the one-man rock monologue into a piece for a trio made up of 12 monologues and 12 songs. Using nearly 80% of Larson's own words, Auburn would reconstruct the piece to be an accurate autobiography of the composer himself, framing the show so audiences could invest in Larson's anticipation, disappointment, and perseverance in real time. The show would now follow Larson leading up to the actual workshop of Superbia, instead of everything taking place after. The off-Broadway production of Tick Tick Boom would open in May of 2001. Much in the same way the original monologue in 1990 spoke to producer Jeffrey Seller, the piece resonated just as strongly with an audience member in November of 2001. The conflicted graduate's name was Lin-Manuel Miranda, who sadly would never go on to do anything ever again. The ticking bomb was equally as strong in Miranda, in many ways mirroring Larson's journey of disappointment and questioning if he could do this through his 20s before finally hitting it big in his 30s. When I saw Tick Tick Boom my senior year of college, it felt like all of those preoccupations in a more concentrated and personal form. Um, it was like, hey, here's what your 20s are gonna look like, dude, <laughs> if you're really trying to do this. It's safe to say that without Jonathan Larson writing Rent, it would have been extremely difficult for Lin-Manuel Miranda to find inspiration to write himself. Instead of dealing with these larger-than-life mega-musicals set in elaborate worlds of their own, the action, turmoil, and characters of Rent were firmly rooted in a contemporary reality, unlike anything Miranda had seen. Add in the fact that this was the most diverse cast he had ever seen on a Broadway stage, and it was more than enough to ignite his creative spark. Miranda's passion and reverence for Jonathan Larson, and in many ways, the early 1990s New York that he grew up in, can be felt in every little detail of Tick Tick Boom the movie. As he said in an interview with Untapped Cities, production designer Alex DiGirlando and Miranda promised to show the New York of 1990 as it really was, and not a romanticized version. The city was getting its first layer of family-friendly paint, representing an in-between of the dark and grimy 70s Times Square with the bright and vibrant Toys R Us one of the early 2000s. The team dove into endless research to recreate each location, and the end result is stunning. Looking at the Moondance Diner, I would have never believed it was built on a soundstage. I mean, I was half expecting them to just throw in Mary Jane yelling at Lynn's chef, 
just to make it extra authentic. This authenticity translates directly to Larson's 508 Greenwich apartment. His sagging bookshelves and scattered papers representing an artistic haven and a snapshot into Larson's chaotic, eclectic, and restless mind. A restless mind that's on full display in the intense sequence, Swimming. The song finds Larson being hit by the world at all sides, leading him to seek solace in the red and green stripes of his local pool. The team had scouted multiple locations, but nothing felt right until they found a recreation center in the West Village. The pool remarkably had the same design mentioned in the song. Not long after deciding to use the spot, the team would learn that this was the actual pool Larson used most often. Swimming wasn't in the off-Broadway production, and watching it here, it makes sense why. The nature of the song doesn't resonate as strongly without seeing someone legitimately swim. With each camera cut frantically alternating in and out of Jonathan's point of view, the agitated turmoil pouring out in a pulsing stream of conscious rant, each beat matching his frantic strokes, and of course, the ingenious decision to turn the stripes into a musical staff the sequence accomplished something a large majority of musical film adaptations don't. It actually uses the cinematic medium to heighten the song in a way that the stage version just couldn't. This ties into something Asterisk said on the community post I put up asking what makes a good movie musical, where they said, I think the best movie musicals have people behind the scenes who remember that it isn't a stage show and figure out how to get shots that evoke the same feeling, but actually work on film. Too often, it seems that adaptations try to go down the same route Mel Brooks and Susan Stroman did with their film adaptation of the producers, literally picking up the stage show and just placing it in the real world. I dove into this film a while ago with Kate Cast Reviews, but I can't overstate how badly this wastes the potential opportunities to heighten the material. It's funny because even though Broadway is dominated by musicals based on films, the creative teams rarely say that they just want to put up literal replications of the movies on stage. Instead, they seek to shape them to better fit the medium they're in. In other words, the material adapts. And this is what Tick Tick Boom is finally able to do embracing the abstract cinematic possibilities to better serve the story, as opposed to just showing Jonathan running through a forest because it's what the song says he does. And yet, despite this occasional abstraction, the film never fully loses touch with the reality it's grounded in. And that's thanks to Lin's use of the framing narrative. What results is a near perfect intersection between the three different iterations of the piece. You've got Miranda's film, Auburn's off-Broadway interpretation, and most importantly, Larson's original one-man show, all working in unison to contextualize the piece like never before. Larson wrote Tick Tick Boom in 1989, when HIV and AIDS was reaching a peak in America. The crisis was an especially dark time for the art scene in New York City, with Larson himself losing several friends due to the epidemic. At the same time of writing the show, his best friend, Matt O'Grady, revealed he was HIV positive. Though this is referenced in both the stage versions, the film is allowed to explore this unpredictable and harrowing time in a much more personal and tangible way further elevating the inescapable reality of mortality, and asking what we do with the time we've been given. With a story as poignant as this one, the actor who would take on the role of Jonathan Larson would have a heavy responsibility on his shoulders. Not only would we be following the character the entire time, we would be following a character who could come off as narcissistic if not portrayed the right way, but it's apparent from the first note Larson plays on the piano, that the role was in capable hands. And that's because never once over this nearly two hour movie did I ever feel like I was watching Andrew Garfield pretending to be someone else. From his first, hi, I'm John, 
I was in. What a lot of people seem to forget is that on top of looking great, slinging a sewer cap at Paul Giamatti for an anticlimactic end sequence, Andrew Garfield is also a well-seasoned actor. After all, the dude won a Tony Award in 2018 for his performance in Angels in America, which is eight hours long. It's entirely possible that Andrew Garfield might pull off what Jason Derulo just couldn't do and take home a Best Leading Actor Oscar for a movie musical. It doesn't hurt that Garfield is in extraordinarily good company with his equally talented co-stars. Robin de Jesus as Larson's best friend Michael has such a natural chemistry with Garfield. His portrayal of the artist turned corporate marketer serves as a great foil to Larson's bohemian dreamer. Joshua Henry and Vanessa Hudgens sound fantastic, and even though we never really learn much about them outside of their roles as the two singers that accompany Larson's workshop of Tick Tick Boom, they still find a way to humanize the collaborative beauty of the arts. It was kind of weird that Vanessa Hudgens' Caressa gets to share an 11 o'clock number with Larson's girlfriend Susan, but I mean, if I cast Rizzo from Grease in my movie, I'd probably give her a go home song too. Real quick before we move on, if you're like me, then you most likely know the awkward card shuffle. You know what I'm talking about? Where it's either the merch stand needs a credit card, an usher needs to see your ID, or you just desperately want to give your business card to Patty Lapone. Either way, when that moment of truth comes, all you can do is fumble through your wallet. All I can say is thank God I discovered the extra wallet, because now, not only does my wallet look and feel better, but also that awkward card shuffle is gone. If you're watching this at the right time, then you can get in on Extra's 40% site-wide Black Friday deal, which is running from now until November 28th. And even better, I've got a special link, so you can get an additional 5% off on top of that. So hurry up to get the perfect addition to yours or a loved one's theater game, while also supporting the channel at the same time. Link is on screen, but also in the description. Anywho, you ever seen 2008's Incredible Hulk? And at the end of the film, the general's at the bar, and all of a sudden, he meets up with Tony Stark. As a 12-year-old kid, seeing the two worlds combine for the first time, that was a lot to deal with. So imagine how this 25-year-old kid felt when he got hit with Andre de Shields, Beth Malone, Pippa Sue, Renee Elise Goldsberry, and, not Peggy, all walking into the Moondance Diner. If musical theater fans freaked out over the Broadway nods in In the Heights, I don't think any of us were ready for the full-on headbangs this movie gives us. But while the cameos were exciting, Amber over on the Patreon brought up a really good point in saying, I loved them, but I also realized how distracting that was. This is a movie 150% for theater people but I think it really will alienate others that are not fully invested into the theater world of today. And while I can absolutely see this happening, I don't think it's gonna be as big a deal as we think. I view it in the same vein as the dirty jokes that got slipped into old Nicktoons when we were growing up. They went right over my head, but my parents got them because they were the ones it was directed towards. Much in that same vein, the Easter eggs are definitely there, but I don't think it's going to throw anyone off to the point that they don't still enjoy the story. The only part that's really going to confuse people is Sunday, where the references are definitely overwhelming for someone who, as you said, isn't fully invested in the theater world. Like, I can literally hear my mom right now just saying, who are all these people? Why is the diner wall opening up? I don't get it. I'm putting on Titanic. But for the most part, they keep it to a nod and a wink, much like in the Heights did, presenting the moments in a, we see you, kind of way. Regardless, it's apparent that Miranda wanted to do something different from every other movie musical offering of this year. Hell, maybe even ever. Instead of trying to make a movie for the masses, he decided to embrace the artists that have always been here. You can feel through every shot, every song, every second, 
that Miranda wanted to inspire creatives much in the same way he had been back in 2001. It's a remarkably intimate and genuine movie, especially considering it's Miranda's first, speaking directly to anyone who has ever questioned if they can really accomplish what they set out to be in a world that tells them they never will. The ticking bomb. The staccato rhythm mirroring our heartbeats, unstoppable journey to its final destination. Each beat, a reminder, a regret, an opportunity, a moment built on another moment, increasing in tension as the timer gets louder and louder and smaller and smaller with us having no way to stop it. But by fixating on the inevitable end result of the ticking bomb to come, we oftentimes fail to appreciate the ticks it takes to get there. And so we let the bomb beat on and try to make sure each tick, tick, tick counts. Tick, tick, boom is both a love letter to the mystical dream of Broadway and also the seemingly trivial struggle it takes to attain it. Over 25 years after his passing, the music and story of Jonathan Larson continues to speak to a generation of dreamers. Those of us who have sticky notes full of ideas floating around in our pockets. Those of us who sit at our desks by the 2 a.m. lamplight with the world rushing around us while we just ask, what am I doing? All of us who continue to embrace our creative sides in one way or another, no matter what our family, friends, or the odds tell us. The movie just gets it. And a large part of that comes down to how Lynn felt the same way. With how huge a star as Lin-Manuel Miranda is, he could have made any movie he wanted to. There's a reason he chose this one to be his first. It's a film meant to ignite the spark in a new generation of theater kids, made by one who made it big. Instead of shying away from musical theater to appeal to a larger audience, the film doubles down on unashamedly embracing who it's meant for. The lovers of this heartbreaking, inspiring, and challenging thing we call art. Tick Tick Boom was such a different experience compared to the last musical I watched on Netflix. One that was so crazy, I had to actually go see it in person and learn how this thing came to be. So put on your feckity 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 feck you dress, grab some wine, and click this video to learn more about the ridiculousness that is Diana the Musical. What are your thoughts on Tick Tick Boom? I'd love to hear more about it in the comments. Thanks again to all the members of the Patreon posse for making this video possible. Remember to live truthfully in those imaginary circumstances and Chester sends his love. <laughs>